بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم رمضان مبارك عليك معلينا وعلى المسلمين جميعا رمضان مبارك to everyone uh, I want to thank uh, the Sheikh Salama Foundation for this opportunity and uh, Sheikh Maryam and all of the people uh, working here. Uh, time is very limited. I'm not used to speaking without a podium. I feel naked, but this is the TED approach to things. So um, what I wanted to talk about, the idea of extremism, looking at it as an illness, um, and what is the illness, what's the etiology of the illness, and then uh, how is that illness treated? If you look uh, at just living in the world, all of us will get sick. Um, societies get sick, people get sick. And our Prophet ﷺ said, Inna Allah lam yunzil da'an illa anzal lahu shifa, that God has not sent down any disease because it's, we believe good and evil are creations of God. That he did not send any disease down except that he sent down with it a cure, a healing. He knows it who knows it and is ignorant of it who's ignorant of it. The, the thing about this hadith, which is very interesting, is that the Quran talks in terms of diseases and cures as opposed to problems and solutions. And part of the reason for that is problems and solutions, which is an engineering language, um, the idea that you can suddenly just, once you get the solution, you implement the solution, the problem goes away. When you look at disease and illness, diseases take time to come about because health is the natural condition, but over time through bad eating, uh, if you have a disease which is uh, an ideological disease, over time through indoctrination, the mind gets sick. And so looking at it in terms of disease and illness, he healing is a better way because you understand that the problem, the, the problem that you're looking at, this, this diseased condition is not something that you can simply solve overnight. It will take time because it took time to come about. And very often Kierkegaard, the great Danish philosopher, talks about creeping villainy. That most people don't see villainy when it first emerges. They, 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 it takes time before they recognize. Once it, it's become palpable. The, um, so I want to look at some of these Really, the, 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 in Arabic, it's khalal, uh, which is, it, it can mean facade, like corruption. It's, it's a, in this case, it's a gaping defect. The gaping defects in the understanding of people that are now what we call extremists, the mutatarrifun. Uh, unfortunately, some are called, call them usuliyun, fundamentalist, which is a problem because usuli is a very high term in the Arabic uh, tradition. But the first major defect is what would be termed, uh, and this is from uh, the great scholar Sheikh Abdullah bin Biya, these five akhlal, or these five defects in extremist understanding. But the first one is the minhaj al ijtiza, which is a type of s segmentation. It's a decontextualization of a tradition which is quite vast and holistic by its very nature. If there's a famous story about the blind men that look at the, Indi the elephant and one of them is feeling the trunk and describing the elephant as being like a pillar, another feeling the nose, another feeling the leaf. If you have a segmented uh, view of something and not a holistic view, then you will always uh, have a problem because you'll never be able to see the thing for what it is. You will only see uh, part of what it is. So, the first major problem that you have is It's engaging the, the revelation because we have the nas is the Quran and the hadith first and foremost. It's engaging the revelation without understanding the holistic nature of it because the Quran, although it came down piecemeal, it is a holistic tradition. Abu Ali, uh, Abu Ali al farisi the great Persian grammarian, Ibn Hisham mentions in Al-Mughni, that Abu Hisham said that Al Quran kulluhu kasuratan wahida. All of the Quran is like one chapter. In other words, you cannot 
take one part of the Quran. In fact, the Quran says, Do you take, believe in part of the book and then you don't believe in other parts of the book? The Quran is a holistic tradition that takes many, many years uh, to master. So, for instance, in Surah Al Hijr, it's, uh, the, the Prophet is described as being mad uh, by his detractors. The answer or the response to that doesn't come until much later in Surah Al-Qalam. It didn't come immediately after that. The response came much later because this is the way that the Quran works. It's not a linear book. Uh, it's, it's a very deep book. In fact, the deep structure of the Qur'an, which has been studied for centuries by scholars, uh, and Al-Qudai is probably one of the greatest commentators on the deep structure of the Qur'an, is, is actually very profound. Over time, people who have studied the Qur'an for many, many years uh, begin to see these connections. So when you look at this, for instance, there is a hadith, and it's in the Arba'in al nawawiyah which is one of the most famous collections of a hadith that many, many Muslims around the world have memorized and, uh, and it's taught in many schools. There is a hadith in that collection which is a sahih hadith, um, a sound hadith from the Prophet. أُمِرْتُ أَنْ أُقَاتِرَ النَّاسِ حَتَّى يَشْهَدُوا أَنْ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ وَأَنَّ مُحَمَّدًا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ وَيُقِيمُ الصَّرَاةَ وَيُؤْتُ الزَّكَاءِ فَإِذَا فَعْلُوا ذَلِكَ عَصُمُمْ مِنِّي دِمَاءُهُمْ وَأَمْوَارُهُمْ إِلَّا بِحَقَّ الْإِسْلَامِ وَحِسَابُهُمْ عَلَى اللَّهِ تَعَالَى So this hadith says, I was commanded to fight people until they say la ilaha illallah and that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah and they establish prayer and they give zakat and once they do that then their blood and their wealth are free from me except by the right of Islam. It's pr their blood and wealth are protected except by the right of Islam meaning if they kill somebody or something or steal and their reckoning is with God. It's not for me to judge them as Muslims. Their reckoning is with God. Now this hadith is, is a, a deeply problematic hadith because many of the extremists take this hadith and say, here's permission to actually fight other people that disagree with us. If you don't say, la ilaha illallah, the Prophet ﷺ was commanded to fight you until you say it. Well, part of the problem with that understanding is that if you look at the word nas, which means people, I was, I was commanded to fight people. Umirton uqatir al nas. So nas is the word that's used. Manhum al nas. That's the question. Manhum al nas. In the Quran, qad ta'ni al fard al wahid. Alladina qad lahum al nasu. Inna al nas qad jama'u lakum. So this was one man, uh, Nu'im bin Mas'ud al Asja'i. Uh, there was a waft from Abdul Qais and they met Abu Sufyan and then they went and this man said to the, the, the Sahaba, to the companions, oh Abu Sufyan and his group have gathered and they're going to come back and fight you after Uhud. So this was one person and yet the Quran says one because one of Asalib al Arab, Al Am wa Urida bihi al Khas that you use a general term but you mean something very specific by it and this is something that you learn when you study Balagha and Usul al-Fiqh so another meaning of people in the Quran Am yahsudun al-nasa ala ma'atahum Allah do they envy people now people here meant one group of people in this verse it, it doesn't mean all people it just means one group even though the alif lam is used uh, Another example, So here you have the same word in the Quran used for three different meanings as an individual, a small group, and all of humanity. And this is part of the difficulty of, and this, this is part of the difficulty of understanding our tradition, but also why the Muslims, the, traditionally the scholars demanded that you studied Arabic for years before you were allowed to interpret or speak about the Quran or the Hadith. You had to study Arabic until you mastered uh, Nahu, Sarf, Mantiq, Balagha. Once you learn these tools of learning, rhetoric, which is an extensive study in the Arabic tradition, then you were capable of interpreting the Quran. But even then you had to learn, according to Ibn Juzay al-Kalbi, he gives 12 sciences necessary before anybody can comment on the Quran. 
And that's why the Quran, if, if these sciences aren't learned, becomes a dangerous book. So who men al ma'mur bi qital al nas? When the Prophet says Umirtu, this couldn't be something specific to him. That once they, they begin to oppose him on the Arabian Peninsula, he was given permission. Uzina lilladinu qataru bi annuhum ghulimu. Permission was granted for those who were being fought to fight back. And so this was given, the permission was given to the Prophet to do this. And so Imam al juwaini one of the great Usuri scholars, said, Wa amal jihadu fa mawkurun ila al imam. The jihad itself is something specific to the leader of the Muslims. And this would be traditionally the Khalifa, but today this is only relegated to the nation states that the Muslims now live under. And there are many ways that the Muslims can live. The idea, which I'll get to that later. Uh, so part of this problem, you have particular verses, but then you have universal principles. They cannot be in contradistinction. So the universal principle has to be working with the, uh, the particular situation. And this is, this is very important because there is a, there is a very subtle relationship between the universal and the particular in usul al-fiqh which is completely lost on these ignorant people. The second uh, problem, defect, the gaping defect is Now this is technical but it's very important because what happens you have two types when, when God speaks to people he speaks in two ways and this is identified by our usuri scholars. One of them is called khitab khitab takrif If you are uh, a, an adult, baligh, then you have a, a responsibility if you're a Muslim to do certain things. Like Allah says, aqimu salah. Now if, if you ask me, is prayer wajib? Hal as-salah wajibatun? The usuli could say, hal anta baligh? Are you, are you an adult? Because if you're not an adult, it's not wajibah. This is called the khitab al wada which is the situational discourse. So you have the discourse of obligation, but then you have a situational discourse. Now the discourse of obligation is asking you to do something or commanding you to do something, commanding you not to do something, so amr and nahi, and then ibaha, kulu wa sharabu, wa la tusrifu. Ibaha, you can do it or not do it as you like. So this is called khitab takrif The wada. The khitab al wada which is the situational, is, has asbab, it has its means, it has its condition, shurud, it has its rukhas, its licenses, it has its azaim, its firmness, and then it has its mawana. It has those things that prevent it from being implemented. To give you an example, if the sun passes the 90 degree angle, this is a sabab for dhuhr. In other words, dhuhr, the khitabu takrif comes in once the time has come in if you're a male. But if you're a menstruating woman who's an adult, there's a manna, there's a preventative that prevents you from implementing that uh, legal ruling. And this applies to all of the ahkam of Islam. So jihad, for instance, it has asbab, it has its, its reasons, it has its conditions, and it has its preventatives. It has things in which it's not permissible to wage. And then there are rukhas and azaims. And, and this all has to look, if you look, the outward movement is towards the waqa, the reality of the situation. So in any given situation, an usuri scholar has to look to see, is this ruling applicable? Omar ibn al-Khattab, during the Amr Ramada, he did not implement uh, certain punishments for theft, why? Because he understood that people were in a state of necessity. Necessity permits the impermissible. And so he suspended that punishment. That is not to say that he removed the ruling of God. No, it was his understanding that that ruling did not apply in this situation. And there are many examples of that in our legal tradition. In the hadith of Tirmidhi relates it, and Nasa'i Nu'im ibn Hammad is the narrator, innukum fi zamanin man taraka minkum ushara ma umira bihi halak. You're in a time, if you leave one-tenth of what I have brought, you will be destroyed. There's coming a time, if you fulfill one-tenth, 
you will have salvation. Shaykh Abdullah bin Bayya understands this to be related to khitab al wadah that towards the end of time, the latter days, many of the things that were applicable in the earlier time, the conditions are no longer there for its applicability. This is not to suspend the ruling of Sharia, but to understand that the Sharia is wise. And there are times when it's appropriate to apply things and times when it's not appropriate. I'll give you an example. Ibn Humam, one of the greatest of the Hanafi Usuri said, when ignorance is widespread, there should be no application of had punishments. So if you have widespread ignorance, you cannot implement had punishments because people are ignorant and they're acting out of their ignorance. The, the third gaping, gaping defect is فكر ارتباط بين الأوامر والنواهي ومنظومة المصالح والمفاسد. The Usuli scholar always looks at masalih and mafasid. They look at a cost-benefit analysis in any situation. What is the benefit? What is the harm? And, and the, the Dar al Mafsada is always understood to be first and foremost to avoid harm. So, whenever harm is more considerable than the benefit, then it's prohibited. And not acknowledging this is something that's caused great trial and tribulation in the Muslim world. Because Muslims take these legal rulings that have to be understood within the four pillars. And these pillars were identified by our scholars um, these, that all of the sharia, all of the sacred law of Islam is wisdom, it's justice, it's rahmah, and it's maslaha. Ibn Qayyim al jawziyah says, if it goes from hikmah to abath, it's not from the sharia. If it goes from wisdom to foolishness, it's not sharia. If it goes from justice to oppression, it's not sharia. If it goes from mercy to cruelty, it's not sharia. If it goes to maslaha, to mafsada, to, from benefit to harm, it's not sharia. Let me give you one example. In, in the old books of fiqh, the qisas, when you have qisas, the ulama said that because the Quran says, aqibu bi ma bihi, that you should punish in the same way that's punished. In some of the texts, they said that if somebody uh, punishes by fire, they should be punished by fire. So if somebody murders somebody by fire, they should be, so, uh, this is what uh, Sidi Khalil says that if somebody uh, kills somebody else, they should be killed with the same means. This is what they call the lex talionis in, 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 in the tradition, the eye, the eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, retribution. Scholars never implemented that because there's a hadith in Al-Bukhari that says, nobody should kill with fire except the people uh, except the Lord of fire. So nobody should punish another person with fire except the Lord of fire. So the ulama didn't implement this even though it's mentioned in the books. So ignorant people come and they see this in the books and they say, oh well this, this is how sharia should be implemented. So the, the, uh, this, just a, a few examples. Sayyidina Omar, the Quran says, حَتَّى يُعْطُوا الْجِزْيَةَ عَنْ يَدٍ وَهُمْ صَاغِرُونَ that they should pay jizya from their own hand uh, in a humbled state. So jizya was part of the Islamic uh, sharia. So people, minority communities paid this thing called jizya, which is a, a tax. It's a protective tax. It, you enter into a status of called dhimmatud, the dhimmiyun. Dhimma means protected, fi dhimmati. The Arabs still say this, huwa fi dhimmati. It's, in, it's I'm responsible for him. So this was an idea. Now, Omar accepted sadaqa instead of jizya from the Arab Christians and from the Jews of Himyar. Why? Because they didn't want to pay jizya. And Omar was fine because it was their thaqafa, it was their culture that they felt that it was undignified for them as Arab Christians or as Jews from the Yemeni tribes to pay jizya. And so he took from them sadaqa. Even though the Nasr Quran is this, because Omar understood that there was greater benefit in that. Now, if you look, jizya, according to Sheikh Abdullah bin Bayya, is only one of the possibilities in the Sharia. He identifies four in the history of Islam. The first is Umirtu an Uqatir al Nas. This came for the Mushrikeen of the Arabs that were fighting to eliminate the Muslims. This came for the Byzantine uh, Empire. 
But this is a general principle that's never been abrogated. If people incline towards peace, you can enter into a peace like we today we have international treaties between people. And the fourth one, which he considers the most appropriate for the current environment, is the Sahifatul Medina, which is where the Prophet ﷺ gave full enfranchisement to the minority communities of Medina. And Imam al-Shafi'i says, I know of no one that differs in Lam a'lam mukhalifan min ahl al-ilm bi seer anna Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam lamma nazar bin Medinati wada al-Yahud kafatan ala ghiri jizya. He made a treaty with them without jizya. Now there will be some who say, well, that abrogated, that was abrogated by the verses in Tawbah. But these aren't abrogated. So this has been a neglected aspect of our tradition. So this aspect has unfortunately not been studied as it should be appropriately studied. It's interesting that there's a Western scholar who's written a book recently on this subject. The Prophet said, No building of worship was destroyed. And the Prophet actually, He prohibited to destroy buildings uh, uh, in war. It's one of the prohibitions in war. The fourth uh, problem here is, is is not understanding the contextualization of jihad. So if you look, for instance, in the earlier period, the, 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 the concept of jihad, it, it, it arose in a situation where there were no treaties. The, the Arabs used to say, If you don't fight Rome, Rome will fight you. This was the environment of the pre-modern world. If you look at the pre-modern, uh, all of the pre-modern borders, you will see that they're borders that were fought for. People fought. And so the Byzantines were attacking the Muslims. The Muslims were attacking the Byzantines. This was the world. Even at the early period, the Arabs were a group of tribes. Many of these tribes lived off attacking other tribes. And they actually had conditions in which they fought. And for, for instance, they wouldn't uh, take the harim generally, the women, because it would cause a whole cycle of violence. But they could steal goats. And then they would steal their goats or camels. And then the other tribe, when they got their opportunity, they would go steal their goats and camels. This was the environment that the Arabian Peninsula Arabs were living in. There was a lot of starvation and other problems. This has to be understood when you read the verses of Jihad. Shaykh Abdullah bin Bayya said that in the early period of Islam, there was a khilaf about Jihad al-Talab and Jihad al difa about whether there was preemptive jihad or only defensive jihad. Ibn Taymiyyah was of the opinion that jihad was only defensive, and he argued that anybody that studies the seerah deeply will see that the Prophet ﷺ only fought defensively. Now what's interesting about this, he says today this debate should be over. That jihad should be understood to be the right which the United Nations gives every nation to defend themselves against an invading or occupying force. And, and the idea of going out in an age of nuclear weapons, in an age of aerial bombardment, and attacking other people is insanity. <laughs> These people literally should be declared insane because they're bringing so much harm on people by doing this. So, The other is, the, so if you look, Ayatul Jihad wa Ahadithu Ayatul Saif, Yartabitu Kullun Minha bi Siyak and Khas in Jiddan. Each one, now Zark, Imam Zarkashi, one of the great Usuli scholars, said, Kullu Amran Warada Yejibim Titharo Hu fi Waktin Ma. Everything that comes down will find its appropriate time and place. Li illatin tijibu dharik al hukum, because of some legal rationale for the, the, the ruling or the category. Thumma yantakil bin tiqari tirk al illati ila hukman akhar. And then when the, the rationale changes, it, the category or the ruling will change. This is the depth of our tradition, and this is why Islamic law is much closer to constitutional law than it is to statute law. And unfortunately, many Muslims see it as statute laws. They don't understand that these laws have asbab, shurut, mawani, that every ruling in Islam has reasons, it has conditions, and it has 
prohibitions or preventatives when it's not used. And finally, and I, I, my time's out, so I'll finish this. Al Khalal al Khamis, Al Tasawwur al Tarikhi al Sathi, this superficial understanding of history, which so many of the Muslims romanticize history. One of the interesting things about the Muslim world is you have no, no Muslims will watch Star Trek. It's, you cannot get this kind of science fiction because Muslims, they're not interested in the future. We have a romanticized view of the past. We want to return to the past. There's this nostalgia about the past, and yet very often it is completely fantastic. It's an emotional view of the past that never existed in reality. The idea that somebody like Salahuddin al Ayyubi will just emerge and come as a savior and remove all the hardships and tribulations from the Muslims. If you study the life of Salahuddin al Ayyubi, he was involved in a very complex uh, situation. And so this is one of the major problems that we have in the Muslims do not recognize that Muslim civilization, like the human life, also has seasons. It has growth, it has uh, strength, and then it has decay, decrepitude, and it dies. And this is simply a fact. And you cannot restore what is dead. And, and again, this is a major problem. So if you look at Abdul Malik bin Marwan, he actually paid the Romans at the height of Muslim civilization. He paid the Romans to guard the borders. So he was paying money to the Romans. Salahuddin Ayyubi fought with Christians against Muslims. Amir Abdul Qadr al Jazairi, the great Algerian Mujahid, at times allied with the Christians against Muslims because these people were pragmatists and they understood that life is compromised. The Prophet never compromised his principles, but he did compromise. And Hudaybiyah is one of the great examples of that. So another thing is that a lot of these Muslim extremists don't understand that the nation state is an acceptable form of governance. The fact that we now exist in nation states because to remove these nation states would create more mafsada min maslaha. You would actually create more terror, more harm than benefit. And so this is part, they, they still are thinking in terms of empires of the past. And finally, in conclusion, our Prophet ﷺ said, That this knowledge will be carried in every generation by upright people. The distortions of extremists. The decontextualizations of nullifiers. If we take these three, we have to address rectifying this segmented understanding of Islam. We also have to refute those people that attempt to nullify the, the beauty and, the, and, the, and the, the mercy of Islam by only pointing out certain decontextualized verses and not pointing out others, and then elevating the general culture and understanding of our Muslim community, which has fallen on hard times. We have a lot of illiteracy, we have poor education, and these things have to be addressed. And finally, a lot of this can be done. I, I'm out of time, so I'll leave it for the thing. But one of the things that, and I hope the, the, the Emirates thinks about this, is that the criminalization of anathematization, of, of declaring other people disbelievers or outside of Islam. The Prophet said that to call a Muslim a kafir is like killing him. Because there are people that will actually take it as a permissibility to kill them. And as somebody who was declared a murtad, and, and, and asked for their blood to be shed, I can honestly say I understand the wisdom behind this. So it's, it's something that, uh, that we as, as Muslims need to think deeply about, about this ideology of takfir, of accusing other people of being outside of Islam uh, and, 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 and not being part of this ummah. Because this group, unfortunately, the, the, these extremists, they view themselves as representing the ummah and only them, and everybody else is astray. The, prophet, the, the Quran says, وَلَا تَقُولُ لِمَنْ أَلْقَى إِلَيْكُمَ السَّلَامِ لَسْتَ مُؤْمِنًا Don't say to anybody that gives you peace, you're not a believer. أَقُولُ قَوْلِ هَذَا وَاسْتَغْفِرُ اللَّهِ شُكْرًا سَلَامُ عَلَيْكُمْ بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولاه أصحاب السمو أصحاب السعادة سيدات والسادة السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته 
ورمضان مبارك إن شاء الله عليكم جميعا بعد هذا التحليق في آفاق الفقه وأصول الفقه وإشكاليات إنزال الأحكام على الوقائع ومقتضى الحال أريد أن ألطف جو قليلا ببعض الصور الجميلة والتي سأبدأ بها إن شاء الله هذه الصورة الأولى هي لأغلى الأماكن على قلبي في مدينة طرابلس عاصمة ليبيا وهو مبنى المدرسة العثمانية التي أسسها عثمان باشا الساقزلي والي طرابلس منذ نحو أربعمائة سنة هذه المدرسة هي قلب المدينة القديمة في طرابلس وفي وسط هذه المدرسة باحة جميلة جدا كنا نجلس فيها لقراءة القرآن وللذكر ولتدريس ودراسة العلم الشريف وفيها شجرة الحنة هذه في الوسط سأعود إلى هذه الصورة الذي أريد أن أتحدث عنه حقيقة هو ما تعنيه هذه الصورة من معاني أو ما تحمله من معاني وما تحمله من مفهوم المدينة والمدنية وهو ما أريد أن أتطرق إليه اليوم نحن في هذه الليلة نتحدث عن التطرف ونتحدث عن الإرهاب ونتحدث عن هذه الجماعات التي هي في الحقيقة تجديد لفكر الخوارج المعروف طيلة التاريخ الإسلامي وكلما ظهر منهم قرن كما وعد المصطفى صلى الله عليه وسلم قطع ولكن لا أريد أن نشغل أذهاننا بما هو سلبي وما هو مظلم ولكن أريد أن أؤكد على ما هو إيجابي حقيقة وأعتقد أن أفضل طريقة لمكافحة الإرهاب ولمقاومة التطرف هي العودة إلى الجذور والآفاق التي كانت تحلق فيها الحضارة الإسلامية وأن نحاول أن نبني من جديد مدنية جديدة وأقول مدنية وهذه الكلمة كبيرة قد تعني عند في أذهان الكثير ما يسمى بالإنجليزية سيفيليتي أو باللاتينية سيفيلتاس وهي كلمة تستخدم الآن عندما نقول المجتمع المدني ونقول نريد أن نقيم دولة مدنية نستخدمها هكذا ولكن أنا أريد أن أستخدمها هكذا وأيضا أن أستخدمها بالمعنى الإسلامي الأصيل بالعودة إلى مدينة المصطفى صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا السلف الصالح رضوان الله عليهم أحس بأن المدينة معنى عميق وأن مدينة المصطفى صلى الله عليه وسلم منورة من عدة نواحي ففيها المصطفى صلى الله عليه وسلم صاحب الأنوار المحمدية المصطفوية التي تنور الأمة ولكنها أيضا مدينة منورة بعلمه صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا الذي لم ينقطع بعد انتقاله إلى جوار ربه صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا العلم النبوي الشريف عاش في المدينة واستمر في المدينة وتوارثته الأجيال وورثه رجل عظيم رحمه الله تعالى اسمه مالك ابن أنس مؤسس المذهب المالكي في الشريعة الإسلامية هذا الرجل استشعر المعاني الراقية للمدينة المنورة فلم يرث فقط أحكاما فقهية مجردة أو أحكاما قانونية كما نقول الآن بالمصطلح العصري ولكن علم هذا الرجل أن النور المحمدي صلى الله على صاحبه هو نور يقذفه الله في القلب فعرف العلم الشريف بأنه نور يقذفه الله في القلب فالإمام مالك رحمة الله عليه عرف أن هذه المدينة مليئة بالأنوار وأن هذه الأنوار تكمن في القلوب وتتوارث في القلوب وتتوارث بالصحبة الصالحة وبمجالسة الصالحين فمجالس العلم الشريف في المدينة المنورة ومجلس مالك رضي الله عنه وأرضاه كان مجلسا منورا على عدة مستويات فلم يكن فقط يدرس الحديث الشريف بسنده المتصل إلى حضرة المصطفى صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا ولكن كان أيضا يدرس السمت حتى أن بعض الطلبة كان يقول جلست مالكا لأستفيد من سمته لا من علمه فقط والسمت 
هو طريقة الكلام طريقة الجلوس طريقة المعاملة طريقة الحنو على الضعيف طريقة معاملة حتى الحيوان الأليف فمالك رضي الله عنه وأرضاه كان يتسم بأخلاق نبوية محمدية مدنية فعندما انتقل المذهب المالكي من مكان إلى مكان انتقلت معه هذه الأنوار وهذه التعاليم الأخلاقية أيضا فمالك كان يعلم حتى الأخلاق ويعلم هذه الأنوار ومن حسن حظ شمال أفريقيا والمغرب العربي بصفة عامة أن هناك بعض من انطلق بعد الفتوحات الإسلامية من أهل المغرب إلى أقصى الشرق للمدينة الم... إلى المدينة المنورة ليتعلم بين يدي الإمام مالك رضي الله عنه وأرضاه وكان منهم الإمام العلامة علي بن زياد الطرابلسي مولدا وتونسي وفاة ومدفنة هذا الرجل الجليل انطلق من طرابلس واعتقد انه انطلق من هذا المكان من 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 مكان بني على انقاضه هذه المدرسه او بنيت على انقاضه هذه المدرسه انطلق من هذا المكان وذهب الى المدينه واتى بكتاب جليل اسمه الموطا موطا الامام مالك وانتقل لا فقط بموطا مالك ولكن باخلاق مالك وانوار مالك رحمه الله على الجميع في هذه المدرسة الشريفة هذه المدرسة بنيت منذ أربعمائة سنة فقط ولكنها بنيت على أنقاض المستنصرية التي بنيت في العهد الحفصي وتلك المدرسة بنيت على أنقاض مدارس قبلها إلى زمن السيد علي بن زياد رحمة الله عليه فهذه المدرسة الشريفة فيها السند متصل حتى يومنا هذا فيها رجال لا يزالون يدرسون بالطريقة المالكية القديمة بالسند المتصل شيخا عن شيخ إلى حضرة المصطفى صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا وقد يبدو هذا غريبا أو قد يبدو أنه ليس بتلك الأهمية ولكن هذه الشجرة التي نراها هي مثال لكيف يجب أن تكون هذه الأمة وكيف يجب أن تكون علاقة هذه الأمة بجذورها الشجرة لا تستقيم ولا تثمر ولا تزدهر إلا إذا كانت متأصلة في أصولها متأصلة في تربتها متأصلة في أعماق التربة بحيث تتغذى من أعماق الأرض التي خلقت فيها ولكن الشجرة أيضا يجب أن تكون منفتحة على الآفاق لو افترضنا في هذه الصورة أن السقف مغلق هذه الشجرة لن تعيش إلا بأنوار مصطناعية أو غير ذلك لا تستطيع أن تعيش بلا هواء وبلا نور هكذا الأمم السيد الشيخ حمزة حفظه الله ذكر أن الحضارات مثل الأشجار تنمو و و وتكبر وتزدهر وأيضا تندثر لكن هناك أشجار متجددة هناك زيتونات في وادي بني وليد في ليبيا حيث توجد قبيلتي هناك زيتونات 700 سنة عمرها أو أكثر الشجر يتجدد كيف يتجدد؟ يتجدد بأمرين مهمين التأصيل والانفتاح تأصيل بدون انفتاح على آفاق العصر آفاق الـ 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 الواقع آفاق مقتضى الحال آفاق الظروف التي نعيشها لا يتأتى أيضا شجرة بدون أصل إنما تكون شجرة عرضة لأن تتقلب هنا وهناك بلا ثبات ولا ركائز يجب أن تكون لهذه الأمة ثوابت وثوابت هذه الأمة أهم هذه الثوابت شيء بسيط جدا نعم هناك ثوابت القرآن والسنة هذا, هذا معروف ولكن هناك معنى مهم جدا في القرآن والسنة من صميم القرآن والسنة بل أقول أنه مفتاح القرآن والسنة ألا وهو الرحمة لا يتأتى فهم للقرآن ولا للسنة بدون الرحمة لماذا؟ لأن القرآن والسنة رحمة هدى ورحمة والمصطفى صلى الله عليه وسلم رحمة رحمة مهداة طيب أنا أريد أن أتلقى القرآن والسنة التي هي رحمة وأريد أن أتلقى أنوار المصطفى صلى الله عليه وسلم التي هي رحمة كيف يتأتى هذا المولى عز وجل علمنا كيف يتأتى هذا والمصطفى صلى الله عليه وسلم علمنا كيف يتأتى هذا عندما قال المصطفى صلى الله عليه وسلم في الحديث المسلسل بالأولية والذي أرويه بالسند المتصل وأرويه لكم هنا تبركا إن شاء الله حيث يقول المصطفى صلى الله عليه وسلم الرحم الراحمون يرحمهم الرحمن 
ارحموا من في الأرض يرحمكم من في السماء الراحمون يرحمهم الرحمن ارحموا من في الأرض يرحمكم من في السماء إذا أردت أن تتلقى الرحمة فعليك أن تكون رحيمة إذا عندما تجد شخص يريد أن يفهم القرآن والسنة ويقطع رؤوس العباد فقط لمخالفتهم في الآراء عندما تجد إنسان يعني يدعي أنه يطبق الشرع الشريف ولا تجد فيه إلا الغلظة والقسوة وتجده غائب عن معاني الرحمة حتى مع, مع الأطفال ومع مع النساء مع الضعفاء مع, 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 مع جميع خلق الله هذا كاذب والعياذ بالله بل هو خارج عن, عن ملة المصطفى صلى الله عليه وسلم الحقيقية التي هي في جوهرها رحمة رحمة مهداة بدون رحمة لا يتأتى شيء كان عندي شيخ رحمة الله عليه في قرية صغيرة تسمى الزيادات في بني وليد اسمه مفتاح بن علي فكنت عائدا من كندا بعد دراسات عليا في الفلسفة وفي الأديان المقارنة وغير ذلك فسألته سؤالا قلت له يا سيد الشيخ ما هو المعيار كيف نفرق بين من يدعي الإسلام الحقيقي الصحيح ومن, ومن هو غير ذلك فقال بلهجة ليبية يعروفة وهي طريقة للتدليع كما نقول والتصغير تصغير عارف يعروفة وين ما في حن فيه رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم حيث ما تجد الحنان تجد رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وين ما في قسوة ما فيش رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم فهذا المفتاح الذي علمه لي سيدي مفتاح رحمة الله عليه مفتاح بسيط ولكنه مهم جدا إن غابت الرحمة إن غاب الحنان فالشريعة غائبة من يدعي أنه يعمل الشريعة في خلق الله وهو لا يعمل الرحمة في خلق الله فهو كذاب والعياذ بالله ومن بدل الشريعة فجعلها أداة تسلط واستحواذ على السلطة وتجبر على العباد وتقتيل للعباد وتشريد للناس وإفساد في البلاد هذا لا ينفذ أوامر المصطفى صلى الله عليه وسلم بل هو غائب عن تلك الرحمة المحمدية اللهم صل وسلم على خير البرية وهنا نعود إلى هذه المدرسة الشريفة هذه المدرسة تدرس فيها الرحمة لا تدرس فيها فقط العلوم الإسلامية نعم الحمد لله يدرس فيها القرآن والحديث الشريف ويختم فيها الموطأ ويختم فيها البخاري وتختم فيها رسالة أبي يزيد القيرواني ونعلم فيها المنطق السلم مرونق في علم المنطق ونعلم فيها أصول الفقه بتدريس الورقات للجويني ونعلم فيها البلاغة بتدريس المفتاح كذا وكذا علم تدرس في هذه المدرسة الشريفة بأسانيد متصلة إلى الأزهر الشريف وإلى الزيتونة المباركة وإلى القرويين وإلى فاس متناس وإلى بلاد شنقيط وإلى المدرسة العثمانية العتيقة وكل والمدرسة الحجازية العتيقة هذه المدرسة تدرس كل هذه العلوم ولكن في هذه المدرسة ليليا يطعم الفقراء وفي هذه المدرسة يوميا تطعم القطط في قطط تعيش في هذه المدرسة منذ أجيال تتوالد في حديقة هذه المدرسة وتطعم يوميا في هذه المدرسة يخدم كبار السن وفي هذه المدرسة تقام مجالس العزاء لمن يموت من أهل المدينة القديمة في طرابلس وفي هذه المدرسة تقام الأفراح يقرأ, يقرأ عقد القرآن في هذه المدرسة هذه المدرسة حية تدرس الرحمة تدرس المحبة تدرس المدينة تدرس علم المدينة وتنشر أنوار المدينة المنورة لتحقق مدنية حقيقية ليست مدنية التخلص من الدين والعياذ بالله أو التنصل عن الوحي الشريف والعياذ بالله هذا ليس مدنية المدنية الحقيقية هي التأصل في رحمة المصطفى صلى الله عليه وسلم وفي أنوار هذه المدينة أريد أن أعطيكم نموذجا بسيطا جدا عن, عن من يقيم في هذه المدرسة هذا الرجل رحمة الله عليه توفي العام الماضي اسمه الحاج عمورة ومن كثرة ما نسميه الحاج عمورة اليوم اضطررت أن أسأل ما اسمه حقيقة كل هذه السنوات تعلمت على يديه ولم أعرف اسمه الرباعي فقيل لي أنه الحاج عمورة بن محمد بن صالح الحطماني من قرية غريفة في أقصى الجنوب الليبي هذا الرجل الجليل كان في البداية مساعدا لمعلم القرآن سيد العارف زغوان عاش معه قرابة العشرين سنة 
ثم بدأ يدرس الأولاد الصغار القرآن في بداية تعلمهم ثم ينتقلون إلى شيوخ أكثر علما وأكثر فقها ثم ينطلق هؤلاء الأولاد ليتعلموا الحديث الشريف ويتعلموا الفقه وغير ذلك ولكن هذا الرجل رحمة الله عليه كان أيضا يكنس المدرسة وكان ينظف الحمامات في المدرسة حاشا الحضور وكان يطعم القطط وكان يطعم الضيوف وكان يزور المساكين وكان يزور المرضى وكان رحمة الله عليه حقيقة سندا لكل من كان يأتي إلى هذه المدرسة وهو هو شيخي وقرة عيني رحمة الله عليه هذا الرجل البسيط الجليل الذي عاش في هذه المدرسة طيلة حياته حتى الأسابيع الأخيرة من حياته طلب من شيخ المدرسة أن ينتقل إلى قريته في الجنوب وعندما سأله الشيخ عبد المجيد الصغير حفظه الله قال له أنا يعني أحس أن يعني الأمر قد قرب وأريد أن أموت في قريتي وأدفن هناك ففعلا ذهب أتى إليه أولاد أخيه وأخذوه إلى قريته وتوفي رحمة الله عليه العام الماضي في في قرية الغريفة رحمة الله عليه رحمة واسعة لماذا أقيم هذه الصورة أمامكم لأن هذه الصورة هي مركز كل ما أريد أن أقوله الإسلام والإيمان والإحسان وهي معالم الدين التي علمها سيدنا جبريل عليه السلام إلى حضرة المصطفى صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم فقال ذاك جبريل جاء يعلمكم دينكم كل هذه المعاني مركزها حقيقة الإنسان وكرامة الإنسان ومقام الإنسان لا نقول الإنسان المعتد بنفسه الطاغي باستبداده وبغروره الـ الـ يعني الذي يخرج عن أوامر ربه ولكن نقول الإنسان العبد المحض الذي يتعبد لمولاه عز وجل ويستشعر عظمة المولى عز وجل في كل ما هو حوله هذا الإنسان يجب أن يكون مركز الإسلام هذا الرجل أخذ عن مشائخ أجل الله أخذنا عنه والحمد لله وإن شاء الله ندرس ما ما علمنا هذا الرجل لغيرنا إن شاء الله أمثال هذا الرجل هم من يعيش بهم الإسلام هذا الرجل يعني لا يستطيع أن أن يكون قاسيا مع قطة فما بالك بإنسان نحن نرى هذه الأيام مناظر بشعة أناس تقطع رؤوس أناس أمام أطفال عمرهم ست سنوات في درنا في بلادي ليبيا للأسف الشديد يصلبون الناس باسم الإسلام هذا ليس الإسلام الذي تعلمناه ولا ولا نعرف هكذا إسلام حقيقة ماذا علم هذا الرجل؟ هذا الرجل علم مبادئ خمس حقيقة هذه خمسة مبادئ علمها له مشايخه الذين علمهم مشايخهم مشايخهم الذين علمهم أحمد زروق رحمة الله عليه وهو من أئمة الإسلام مغربي الأصل توفي في ليبيا ودفن في مصراته رحمة الله عليه الشيخ أحمد زروق رحمة الله عليه قال أنه يجب أن نعيش بخمسة أصول علو الهمة وحفظ الحرمة وحسن الخدمة ونفوذ العزمة وشكر النعمة ماذا يقصد الشيخ؟ علو الهمة أن تكون الهمة عالية إنما الأعمال بالنيات وإنما لكل امرئ ما نوى يجب أن تنوي أعلى المعالي وأعلى عليين هو صحبة المصطفى صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم في الجنة إن شاء الله هذا هو أعلى عليين يجب أن تكون الهمة عالية ولكن هذا لا يمنع أن تكون الهمة متعلقة بأمور الدنيا فيجب أن نعمر هذه الدنيا وأن نعيش فيها على أحسن ما يكون فعلو الهمة في الدنيا والآخرة وحفظ الحرمة ماذا هذا ماذا يعني هذا؟ أن نحترم ما احترمه المولى عز وجل وما قرر وما قرر حرمته حرمة المولى عز وجل حرمة الأنبياء حرمة الكتب السماوية وحرمة الإنسان حرمة الإنسان التي هي أعظم من حرمة الكعبة الشريفة المطهرة انظر في هذا المعنى حرمة الإنسان أعظم من من حرمة الكعبة الشريفة ومع ذلك لو قيل لإنسان تهدم الكعبة ماذا سيشعر؟ وها هي الكعبة تهدم يوما في كل يوم آلاف المرات قتلى هنا وهناك حفظ الحرمة يعني حفظ الحياة 
حفظ الكرامة الإنسانية حفظ المال العام حفظ المال الخاص حفظ كرامة الإنسان احترام الإنسان المبدأ الثالث هو حسن الخدمة أن نخدم ال 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 أساس الإسلام أن, أن تكون خادم خادم لغيرك من, من, من بني الإنسان لا أن تكون سيدا عليهم بالتسلط وإنما أن تكون خادم نفوذ العزمة أن تكون لك عزيمة نافذة لا بالتسلط والتكبر وإنما بأن لا تترك للاكتئاب أو للإحباط في قلبك مكان لا بد أن تكون متحفز لخدمة البشر لخدمة الإنسان وأخيرا شكر النعمة أن تكون شاكرا للأنعم التي تتقلب فيها أنعم لا فقط من الرزق ولكن من الزوج الزوجة والأولاد والبيت الذي تعيش فيه والأساتذة الذين درسوك وهذه المدينة الآمنة التي تعيش فيها وهذا البلد الآمن المطمئن اللهم أمنه وأمن بلاد المسلمين كل هذا نعمة الشكر يا سادة من صميم الإسلام وعكس الشكر هو الكفر إما شاكرة وإما كفورة فإنما الكفر هو تغطية نعمة المولى عز وجل والنعمة الكبرى المهداة هي المصطفى صلى الله عليه وسلم الذي علمنا علمنا كيف نعيش وكيف نموت وكيف سنحشر إن شاء الله على حق على 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 خير وبركة لا إله إلا الله محمد رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وفي الخاتمة وقد دهمني الوقت أختم بهذه الصيغة الشريفة في الصلاة على رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم أرويها عن سيدي عمورة من هذه المدرسة وأنقلها لكم لعل بعضكم يتبرك فيها في هذا الشهر المبارك يقول اللهم صل على المصطفى بديع الجمال وبحر الوفا وصل عليه كما ينبغي الصادق محمد عليه السلام والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Good evening. Masal khair alaykum. Sahaf turkum, as we would say in Algeria. It's a very great honor and a privilege for me to be here. And I would like to thank uh, the foundation and all of the organizers for giving us this opportunity to discuss these important subjects uh, together. And this topic is important to me for many reasons, but also for very personal reasons. And I thought I would start off with those, uh, because perhaps you might be wondering why this person with this strong American accent is so interested in this topic and wrote a book about it. And it all goes back to my grandfather in Algeria, who you see here, Lakhdar Benoun, who was a peasant leader in the mountains of northeastern Algeria, and tragically was killed by the French military during the War of Independence in the late 1950s. And I've always believed that my grandfather died for us to have more freedom, not less. And so I believe that it is a responsibility to build on those sacrifices and to go forward to create more freedom for the younger generations in the country that my grandfather and so many others dreamed of. And so that is where I started really thinking about this issue. And I find now, my friends, that the Islam of my grandfather, uh, the dream of my grandfather, is really under siege, under siege from extremist movements, as we all know. Uh, we are seeing terrorism that is killing thousands, hundreds of thousands of people. We are seeing the mass flight now of religious minorities from our regions who have played such an important role in our culture and in our tradition. And I know that that was not the dream of my grandfather. And so, my friends, I really feel, I say this in my book, that we are walking on a tightrope. And the kind of jihad that is happening now is something that my grandfather never would have recognized. And the victims are innocent people, often very young people around the world. As a university professor, I think about the attack at Garissa University in the northeast of Kenya by a militant group based in Somalia that killed 147 students back in April. I think about this because I'm headed to Kenya tomorrow to the African Regional Summit on countering violent extremism. And I think statistics lose the meaning of what we're talking about, which a photo can remind us of instantly. Here you see one of those 147 victims. Bryson was 21 years old. He was the first person in his village 
in the northeast of Kenya to go to university. His entire village came together to gather the funds for him to be able to go to university. And he planned on becoming a teacher and going back home and working in a school in his village. That dream is now wiped out by this kind of jihad, which we, my friends, must figure out how to stop. And that is why I wrote this book, trying to think about this question. How can we stop this kind of jihad? How can we turn the tide in favor of tolerance? Now, I asked people that question around the world, people who were working on the front lines of this issue. People like the woman you see here, Sharifa Kadar, who is the president of Jaza Eruna, which is the Algerian Association of Victims of Islamist Terrorism. And one of the things that she told me that I think is so important for us to consider is that you cannot defeat terrorism simply by fighting an anti-terror battle, that you must take on the ideology behind the terrorism. And I'm so pleased that we are doing that here this evening because that is a very big project. And I believe that all of us, Muslims and people of Muslim heritage, in the diasporas and in our home countries, have an absolute moral obligation to take this on together. So if there are two key takeaways from my talk this evening, they are quite simply this. The first, and this is a point I think I need to make more when I speak in the West, because I think it's understood, of course, here, is that in each and every context, each and every Muslim-majority context or diaspora population, where we see fundamentalist and extremist movements active, there are also brave people pushing back and organizing against them. Now, very often, internationally, people will have heard about the terrorists, but not about those who are challenging them peacefully. And so the second point is that these brave people on the front lines face tremendous obstacles, and they need our support, my friends, to be able to succeed in their very important work. And I want to tell you a few of their stories this evening. So I went out and interviewed about 300 people from 30 different countries, from Afghanistan to Mali. Uh, I traveled endlessly, and it was like being in the university of the world. I learned so much. The people I met were very diverse, but they shared many common objectives uh, that I think relate to the guidelines of the Imam from Dr. Arif's talk. And the first one I want to tell you about here is Aminatou Daouda, uh, who is the daughter of an Imam in Niger and a very devout Muslim, and also wrote her master's thesis on the UN Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. And she sees those things as fitting together perfectly and is working to advance that convention in her country and pushing back against the fundamentalists who oppose it, often with a great deal of humor. She laughs in her challenge to the extremists. I also met this woman, Deep Saida, in Lahore, Pakistan, who is the head of the Institute for Peace and Secularism Studies. And almost any time that there is a terrorist atrocity in Pakistan, in Lahore, Deep is out on the streets protesting against it, organizing others uh, to demonstrate against these attacks. And here you see one example of such a demonstration. Uh, I attended this when I was in Lahore back in 2010. This happened shortly after the condemning to death of an illiterate Christian woman in Pakistan, allegedly for blasphemy. And here you see Muslims and Christians, people of Muslim heritage, people of Christian heritage, standing together in support of this woman and calling for the repeal of the blasphemy law, which is very often used against religious minorities. And as I met these people who are so incredibly brave, I mean, Deep, when she organizes these protests, usually receives phone calls telling her that suicide bombers will come. And her response is, come if you must, but we will be there too. These people are so brave. So the question is, why do we not hear more about them internationally? I mean, why is their work not a big story? Why is it, for example, that everyone knows who Osama bin Laden was, but so few people know of all of those standing up to the bin Ladens and the would-be bin Ladens in their own contexts? We absolutely have to change that. I think it's, it's critical, both for the struggle against discrimination against Muslims in other parts of the world, but also for the struggle against extremism itself. So I undertook this work to support people like this 
But again, I also did it for very personal reasons, moving one generation forward in my family. This is my father, Mahfoud Banoun, who very much picked up the struggle from his father and sought to build the independent Algerian nation, was a professor at the University of Algiers, and with the rise of extremism in Algeria in the 1990s, he, like so many other intellectuals, was a very outspoken critic, writing regular articles in the newspaper, signing his name. He began to get very ordinary death threats day after day at home, on the mailbox, people showing up at the house. But what I will never forget is that he would not give up. He would not stop. He had to stop teaching at the university and he had to move out of his home. But he kept writing article after article. This is one from uh, 1994, which was a very dangerous time in Algeria, called How Fundamentalism Produced a Terrorism Without Precedent in which he wrote that for him, the terrorists were in radical break with the true Islam as it was lived by our ancestors. He grew up in a peasant village uh, where people practiced religion in an entirely different way than what the fundamentalists had in mind. Uh, and he said that they trampled Islam underfoot in the name of jihad. Now, we all know these things, but to write them inside a context like 1994 Algeria was a life-threatening task. And he would stress that I had to say he was one of so many people who did this. He was certainly not alone. And yet what we saw was that the international community failed to recognize the Algerians who were speaking out against extremism. They, again, they knew about the terrorists maybe, but they didn't know about the people who would go out the day after bombings and fill the bomb craters with flowers and stand in protest against those bombings, even when the police would say, we can't protect you. And so I felt that we really have to build more international solidarity with the people who are doing today what my father and his colleagues were doing back in Algeria in the 1990s. Uh, international solidarity is absolutely critical. I interviewed this woman who is a Malian lawyer, Sara Keita Diakite. I interviewed her at a time when the northern half of her country in 2012 was completely under siege from jihadist armed groups. And she said something very important. She said international solidarity is very helpful. When you live such a crisis alone, it is much more difficult to bear. I think of what Libyans are going through today, and I think of how little press coverage there is internationally, and that is unforgivable. So we really need to build the international solidarity with the people living on the the front lines of this issue. So I'm now going to try to tell a few quick stories before ending. Um, I wanted to tell six stories, but that is impossible, and I won't try to tell all 300 that are in the book. But there are thousands I could tell. For example, here you see photographs of women, all of whom were killed by the fundamentalist armed groups in Algeria in the 1990s in a violence that Algerians simply call the dark decade. And most of the world looked away. But this is the reality. And I will tell you the story of one of the families affected by that violence. Again, the family of Sharifa Kedar. So she lives in Blida, which is a town at the heart of what was called the Triangle of Death in Algeria in the 1990s, because it was so hard hit uh, by the violence, perhaps a violence that is reminiscent of things happening elsewhere in this region uh, today. And in 1996, armed men came to her family home, and they killed her brother and her sister, Leila, who is a lawyer there on the left, Mohamed Reda, a businessman on the right, they killed them in front of the entire family. And I asked her, how did you survive this? Because they were killed in a very atrocious way. And she said, I don't know if I did survive. She said, a part of you leaves with them. It is as if your two eyes are gone. But the amazing thing about the Kedar family is that instead of giving in to their grief, what they did, as so many other victims have done, is to create an association to support other victims of terrorism in the house where the attack happened. They couldn't bear to live there anymore, but they created Jaza Eruna, the association there. And they did some very simple things. When other victims were killed by the armed groups, they would organize people, women and men, which is not the tradition in Algeria, women and men to go to the cemetery together with the family of the victim 
victim to show support for the victim's families. And they would protest against terror attacks as well. And today they continue to try to assist victims who continue today to have psychological and material needs. Uh, and they were not the only people to do this work in Algeria. Here you see the women's movement in Algiers protesting against assassinations by the armed groups. And they continue to commemorate the violence today because, my friends, forgetting what has happened uh, is another crime. It victimizes people all over again. And to be able to confront the jihadist violence of today, we have to learn from our history. We have to understand what happened in Algeria and how important popular mobilization against terrorism was, including by very religious people like Haja Kedar, who you see here, who had just made the Hajj right before the assassinations of her son and her daughter. And I've always thought I want young people everywhere in the world who are at risk of recruitment by groups claiming to protect Muslims to see this picture, because this is, in fact, the reality that the jihadist groups have brought to ordinary Muslim families from North Africa to West Africa to South Asia and beyond. And my friends, we have to understand that. It is absolutely critical. This is a story from Northern Mali. I will never forget this man. Unfortunately, I cannot show you his picture. This is Mr. Bodmar. I cannot tell you his real name. He still lives at great risk in the town of Gao, where he was a school teacher. And when the jihadist armed groups occupied his town, many people fled, including the headmaster of the school, and so he became the headmaster. And he risked his life to keep that school open in Gao, educating boys and girls side by side according to the Malian national curriculum. Not only was the town occupied, the school building itself was occupied, and yet he stayed. And I said to him, Mr. Bodmar, why are you doing this? I interviewed him in Bamako. He was getting back in the car the next day to head north with supplies for the school. Why are you doing this? You can do stay here in safety. And he said what you see here, my presence creates hope for my students. I cannot kill this hope. We, my friends, have to support people like Mr. Bodmar and all the others like him doing this work. One of the longest chapters in my book is about women's human rights defenders who are everywhere on the front lines of the struggle against all forms of extremism in other religions as well. Uh, and here you see a brilliant Nigerian sociologist, Zainabu Hadari, who told me something very critical during my research. She said, every step forward for women's rights is a piece of the struggle against fundamentalism. And so I think what we have to take away from this is that women's rights are not an add-on to the battle against extremism. They go to the heart of the battle against extremism. And so we absolutely have to champion the equality of men and women. And men and women need to work together side by side in this struggle. And one of those who's doing that is this woman who I met in Herat in Western Afghanistan. She is the first and only woman chief prosecutor in Afghanistan. And she actually started a unit in her office to prosecute in cases of violence against women. All of this has made her terrorist target number one in Western Afghanistan. And not only has she received threats, but she actually has survived attempts on her life, including one that nearly got her children and that took the leg off of one of her bodyguards. And yet she continues. And again, I asked her, why are you doing this? You, you don't have to do this. And she said, you mean why you risk not living? And I said, yes, that's what I mean. And she told me with no bravado, just simple clarity. She said that the better future for the other Maria Bashirs was worth the risk to her. And she knew that if people like her with education and opportunity didn't take these risks, there would be no better futures for others. And so she went on with the work. And she was very worried when I left her, and must be even more worried now, that as the international community seeks to withdraw from Afghanistan, seeks peace with the militants, seeks to bring them into government, that they will be forgetting about women's rights in Afghanistan. They will be forgetting about women like Maria Bashir. And my friends, that we absolutely must not do. 
So I am nearly out of time, and there are so many other stories that I wanted to tell you, like the story of Mr. Bihi Abdurazak Bihi, a Somali-American whose nephew, Burhan, was recruited by a Somali militant group, uh, but this kid was really no terrorist. He had no idea what he was getting himself into, and ultimately, this 17-year-old straight-A student was killed by the Somali militants who had swept him uh, back to Africa. And since then, his uncle, works tirelessly against the recruitment of other people's nephews, other people's uh, sons. He does this with a shoestring budget. He has no, very little money with which to do this work. So he does very creative things. Like he held a Ramadan basketball tournament a few years ago, right after a Somali militant attack on World Cup viewers uh, in Uganda. So targeting sports there, he was showing youth a way to embrace sports and celebrate Muslim holidays uh, all together at the same time. And again, we need to find the ways in the diaspora to support these people because he did face a, a lot of backlash when he first started doing this. Uh, the imam in the mosque where his son, his nephew was recruited in a youth group, uh, accused him of being an infidel. And Mr. Behe said something that I will never forget. He said, no, I am trying to save the religion I love from a small number of extremists. And that is the task that we all must take on together and that we must support. So let me just finish, and I would love to tell you about this brave young man who's organizing protests uh, on the streets of Pakistan now and has a wonderful campaign. All I will say about him is if you look up on the internet the hashtag Reclaim Your Mosque, he is leading a wonderful campaign to support uh, liberal Muslim clergy around the world. So go and look up, please, Gibran Nasser, Reclaim Your Mosque. And I just want to end with one last story here, uh, which is a story that is very close to my heart because it tells uh, of what happened to one courageous law student, and I am a law professor. Emel Zanoun had the same dreams that I had of a legal career in Algeria back in the 1990s, and she refused to give up her studies, even though the armed groups then, like some of the jihadist groups today, threatened everyone who continued their education. And Emel said to her mother and father of herself and her sisters, who were also students, if something happens to us, you and dad, you must know that we are dead for knowledge. You and father must keep your heads held high. And one Ramadan evening in January of 1997, Emel decided to go home and visit her family and have iftar, what we call ftur, with them. And as a result, she would never finish law school. When the bus arrived in the outskirts of her hometown, it was stopped at what we called a fake checkpoint run by the armed groups. Emel was recognizable as a student with her book bag. She was taken off the bus and she was killed in the street. And so I find with the loss of these kinds of brave young people, I find myself in a way looking for Amel, looking for hope, trying to keep hope in the face of this battle against extremism. But Emel did. Emel wouldn't give up studying. And indeed, the amazing part of this story is, in spite of this awful tragedy, one of her sisters overcame her grief, went to law school in her memory, and practices as a lawyer today in Algeria, something which is only possible because the extremists were largely, not completely, but largely defeated inside the country. And I find Emel's hope in two places. I find it in the courage of the families and the survivors to continue telling these stories so that we can learn from this history as we think about what our strategy should be going forward to reclaim tolerance. And I also find my hope everywhere women and men stand up against extremism, stand up for tolerance. And my friends, there is absolutely no time to lose. Amel Zanoun died at exactly 5.17 p.m. This is her watch. It broke the minute that she fell in the street after her throat was cut. And her mother did me the great honor of allowing me to photograph this watch. And I look at it day after day to remind myself, we have no time to lose. We have to help the next generation get to 5.18 because 517 is continuing to come to too many students, whether in Iraq or Syria, whether in northern Nigeria or in Pakistan. And it is up to all of us to take up this challenge, to stand with the people on the front lines. Thank you very much. I'd like to remind everyone to use the note cards if you have any questions to address to our speakers. 
And I'd like to Pardon. kindly ask you to do your best to write their questions um, clearly with a legible, legible oh, handwriting. Oh, <coughs> um, I'd like to start off by looking back at some of the thoughts and some of the images that um, all three of you have talked about and some of the unfortunate images and some of the very beautiful images that you've also shared with us. And I can't help but think how most of the time a religion is um, not judged by outsiders based on the teachings or the roots of the religion, but unfortunately is judged and based on the actions taken by those who carry its name. So my question is, and it's addressed to all three of you, how do we reclaim Islam from the stereotypes, actions, and crimes that are being committed in its name? And Dr. Karima, you alluded to this in your presentation, but we also have a question from one of the guests here, which is along the same lines. How can we as Muslims who are concerned about the extremists distorting our faith, what can we do to prevent the situation from worsening? Do we have any practical tips from you or ideas to share? To me. Uh, thank you very much for this important <coughs> question. So, I think the question of the, the image that is given to a religion by a small number of extremists has become a very important question. It is certainly entirely unfair when all the adherents, or even in some cases purported adherents of a religion, they may even be in other religions, Sikhs are sometimes attacked in the United States uh, after in response to a jihadist terror attack uh, because an ignorant person thinks that the person is Muslim because they have a turban. Uh, that is absolutely wrong. Uh, so when Rupert Murdoch tweeted after the Paris attacks uh, that all Muslims, as he said, were responsible, uh, that is reprehensible. That too is a kind of extremist thinking. But I do believe that in, in the diasporas we have a responsibility to speak out when these attacks happen by people claiming wrongfully to act in our name. We have a responsibility to do that because we are safer in doing so sometimes than people are elsewhere. And that can really show that there is complete disapproval of these acts and it can also fight the discrimination. There are really concrete ways of doing this. I think about what Gibran Nasser is doing, uh, the pa young Pakistani activist I mentioned. He has another hashtag, Hamare Heroes, H-A-M-A-R-E, Heroes. And it is a tribute to victims. And one of the victims that he pays tribute to is a child named Ihtizaz Hassan, who was a Pakistani 14-year-old who tackled a suicide bomber who was attacking his school with his bare hands. He was tragically killed, but he saved the 900 children in his school. That story should be known worldwide because he is much more representative of the tradition than the bomber, and yet the bomber's story is more likely to be told. The, um, you know, I think Dr. Arif talked about the, the tradition. We have a, a tradition which is the, it's not a counter narrative, it's the primary narrative of our, of our teaching. Um, I know both of us signed on to the Amman uh, message. message, which recognized all these different schools of thought. The Ithna Ashariya, the Ibadiyya that are right next door in Oman, uh, the four Medhabs uh, that are recognized that historically Muslims live together. The Shia communities live together in Iraq and, and intermarried in many places. Um, a lot of what's happening is, um, again, ideology begins to reign supreme and people lose their basic humanity. Uh, there's a German philosopher, Nietzsche, said that insanity tends to be uh, rare in individuals, but it's the norm in groups. And, and there's a lot of truth to that. If you look at the Quran, one reading of the Quran is basically individuals going up against groups. Uh, all of the prophets were individuals and they went up against a group that were thinking like a group instead of thinking like an individual. And so collectivism is a major problem when you get ideological strains that are collectivist by nature and see everything in terms of a group, the ummah, and forget that the ummah is made up of individuals, um, then this is, this is where you can do heinous things. And so that's why the communists 
uh, were so adept at killing large numbers of people for some greater good. This is very similar to uh, the communist uh, ideology, where um, they, they see that the, 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 ends, the end is, is, uh, justifies any means they use to get to the end, and their end is an imagined end. It's not a real end. They will never get to this so-called perfect Islamic State because it's never existed, and it will never exist. The Prophet ﷺ, there were people that drank alcohol in his community. There were people that did uh, naughty things. Um, sometimes he overlooked them uh, and usually attempted to veil them. There are many examples of that in the seerah. Just I'll tell one Ramadan story. A man came to the Prophet and he said, Halaktu, Halaktu, it's over, it's over. He said, what happened? He said, I slept with my wife while I was fasting. He said, why did you do that? He said, I, she lifted her and I saw her white shank and I couldn't resist. And the Prophet laughed. And then he told him to go feed, uh, uh, to fast two months. He said, Ya Rasulullah, I couldn't fast one month. And he said, then, then feed 60 people. He said, what do I feed them with? I don't have any. So he brought dates, he gave him the dates. And then he said, who should I feed them? Nobody's poorer than my tribe. He said, go feed your tribe. This was the Islam that, that Muslims grew up with. This is what they were taught. Everybody knows the story of Sayyidina Ali, whether it's a, apocryphal or not. That every Muslim knows the story of in the jihad when the man spit in his face and he refused to strike him because I, I, it's from my own anger and not for, for the sake of Allah. So these, this is the Islam that, uh, that our Prophet taught and, and it's a restoration of the primary narrative. But we also have to recognize that the great teaching institutions of Islam were largely destroyed during the colonial period. Al-Azhar is attempting to rebuild uh, what, what was destroyed, but this is a real crisis. In Morocco, they're doing amazing work, uh, educating the women, creating a whole uh, a large group of women that go out and teach people. They're doing illiteracy, uh, t teaching illiterate Moroccans on television. There's a lot of things, but we do have a, a primary narrative and it needs to be reasserted because it is the Islam of, of our Prophet ﷺ. If I may uh, continue uh, from where uh, Sheikh Hamza Hafizullah has, uh, has stopped, and uh, that is with Morocco. And I, I here recognize His Excellency, Ambassador of uh, His Majesty King uh, Muhammad Sadis and his uh, spouse, and thank you very much for coming. Uh, Morocco is a very interesting, uh, I would say, lighthouse to study on the preservation of tradition, and not only the uh, preservation of tradition, but also the re-articulation of tradition. It took about a thousand years for North Africa to have a balance between uh, aspects of aqidah, teaching in aqidah, aspects of jurisprudence, and aspects of spirituality. And they were summarized in a great matn, which is called Matn ibn Ashr, which uh, says one of the lines that summarizes the content, fi aqd al-ash'ari wa fi qimalik wa fi tariqati junayd al-salik. This balance between a, a, a doctrinal uh, a theological approach with a juridical approach plus a spiritual approach, which is often forgotten. Without the spirituality, the jurisprudence and the legality is, is, is invalid. It is, it is noteworthy that niya is the very essence of Islam. Innamal a'malu bin-niyat. It is not innamal a'malu coming after niyat. It's innamal a'malu bin-niyat. So niya or intentionality is constitutive of the very action. It is the great Moroccan scholar Ibn al-Hajj wrote a book called Al-Madkhal. And in the introduction, there is a funny story about a, a man who is sitting studying with his teacher, and then somebody knocks on the door. And the man gets up to open the door, the student. And the teacher says, wait, with how many niyas did you get up? <laughs> and, the and the student says, I just got up to open the door. And he said, look at how much you've lost. You could have gotten up with the knee of helping your poor old teacher and opening up the door to a guest and helping the students who are coming and being generous to the, to the, to the uh, person who might be coming to, to ask for something. And he enumerated so many niyas. So we need to preserve this, this science of niya, which is not taught in schools. It is taught to you by your grandmother. You know, the Sahaba cherished what was called Imanul Ajaiz, the faith of the old ladies, okay? And some people just passed 
on this as if, you know, it was a, it's an interesting amusement, you know? It really is serious. I learned what I know about caring for plants and trees and, and, and cherishing the ayat that are the plants from my grandmother. I, she once asked me to go and get some mint leaves in the, from the garden in Tripoli. And I went and I actually pulled out the entire mint plant and brought it to her, very happy. And she said, what have you done? What a crime. You could have just taken the leaves and left it to give more leaves. Now you've just destroyed it. What will you say on the, the day of judgment when this plant comes before Allah Azza wa and says, he killed me. He was so selfish, he took all of me. And <laughs> I cried and then I went and replanted the thing. And from that day on, I never looked at plants the same way. What I'm trying to tell you, don't just spend your days looking at your Facebook or your, or your iPad or whatever it is, or your or video games, especially young people. Spend, st spend time with your grandmother, with your grandfather, with the, the great scholars and sages in your community. Because, believe it or not, they have a wisdom that's actually very quickly dying away and that is not recoverable. It, you cannot get it from books. It is from companionship, from the time you spend with them. What is called suhba. The great mashayikh of our, our tradition said, as suhba sabbagha. Companionship actually dyes you with, like, like you dye the, a cloth with color. It permeates you. It is like bringing one candle that is not lit next to a candle that's lit. It gets lit up. That is what sanad means in Islam. Without isnad, there is no Islam. This ummah is a great ummah, not because it is a conquering ummah, not because it has will to power, it is because it is a manifestation of compassion. We lose compassion, we lose everything. We just become fascists. And I believe that these phenomena that we're seeing are basically an, an Islamicized fascism. They have more in common with Nazis and, and Mussolini's fascists than anything to do with Islam. Sorry for taking so long to, to come. No, thank you. And thank you um, for answering the question so beautifully. Um, and I think that it's also um, probably one more thing which there should be some sort of a mental shift in individuals themselves thinking, who are usually thinking, what can I do? What difference can I make? I'm just an individual. And kind of let it for others to do. And I think it's that mental shift that each individual can bring on change if every one of us tried their best to be the best person that they can be. Um, we have a question here addressed to uh, Sheikh Hamza. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. هل لنا أن نعتبر من عدم تخصيص أو تحديد نظام حكم معين من قبل رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم بمعنى أن حكم الله قابل للتحقق من خلال عدة أنماط من الحكم ما عرف وقت الرسول صلى الله عليه وسلم وما لم يكن يعرف أي أن الأمر اجتماعي سياسي لا ديني رزق الله خير بسم الله This is a technical question but uh, just السائل سأل بالعربية عند العلماء اختلفوا في تنصيب الإمام هل هو حكم عقلي أو حكم شرعي المشهور أنه حكم شرعي وواجب نصب إمام العدل بالشرع فعلم لا بحكم العقل فهذا الجوهر إبراهيم اللقاني ولكن نوع الحكومة يعني هذا حسب الأعراف وحسب الزمان والمكان النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم ما جعل حكومة معينة لدينه ممكن الملكية الدستورية وأنا أفضلها صراحة الملكية الدستورية نوع من أنواع الحكومات التي جرت في التاريخ الإسلامي وطبقت الشريعة كما فعل المغاربة ولهم يعني الحكومة المغربية متصلة إلى 400 سنة وكذلك هذا الحكومات في الخليج العربي عن طريق وأصلهم من القبائل بني يأس يعني هم من قضاعة من اليمن استوطنوا هنا وسادوا في البلاد منذ 100 سنة وأكثر فمنهم المكتوم منهم النهيان هذه الطرق من من طرق المسلمين في في يعني في وضع الحكومة والذي الشريعة تقول أنه لا يجوز الخروج عليهم 
هذا شيء ثابت إذا اتحدوا هذا بينهم مثلا فدرالية كما وقعت في أوروبا هذا قد يكون في المستقبل قد يكون تتحد الحكومات المسلمة كفدرالية أو شيء لا هذا في خيار هؤلاء الناس الذين سيأتون من بعدنا فالحكومات يعني ليست الخلافة التي يفهمها الناس النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم نفى ذلك هو قال أن الحكومة سبت هذا حديث صحيح ستظل خلافة على منهج النبوة ثلاثين سنة فقط وانتهت ثم ذكر الملوك ثم ذكر الجبابرة وهكذا وتعود بالمهدي على قول يعني برجوع المهدي برجوع عيسى عليه السلام وإتيان المهدي هكذا لكن لم يفهمه أحد أنه يأتي في زمن مظلم وهؤلاء الذين يدعون شيء يعني كل يدعي واصلا بليلة وليلة لا تقر لهم بذاك شكرا على إجابتك um, We've received many questions in, um, about the role of education um, and this is a question addressed to um, all three speakers Many people today are being taught a very one-sided view of the world rather than an ecumenical one So what is the role of education in fighting extremism? And what sort of education system can we talk about here? Everywhere that I went, I asked people what they believed to be the most useful solution in the battle against extremism. And almost every single one of them, the first answer was education. It is absolutely critical. And there is very little support being given by the international community to education. I went to a wonderful uh, Afghan educational institute in Herat run by a woman named Dr. Sakina Yakubi. And she said, given how little support institutions like hers get, the Afghan Institute of Learning, she sort of has to ask herself whether or not the international community is really serious about democracy in Afghanistan. Of course, the question is, what kind of education, mm -hmm. right? What we're talking about is education for the values of human rights, for universal values, for true Islamic values. Uh, my father talked about this a lot, sort of making as companions universal values and Islamic uh, values. Uh, education for humanism and for equality. Because of course the fundamentalists understand very well the significance of education and they often target it. And this is true of Christian fundamentalists in the United States as well as Muslim fundamentalists. We see this uh, in Tunisia, for example, uh, where one of the leaders was telling young Salafis the strategy that you should take in the future is to target uh, education. So I think we have to take education very seriously, but it, and we have to support it, we have to put resources into it, make it accessible to all, but we have to think very carefully about who determines the content of that education. Bismillah uh, ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. The um, education is, is absolutely important, but uh, as, as Dr. Karima points out, it's very important to know what kind of education. And I believe the kind of education that worked for centuries in the great seats of learning in the uh, Muslim world, from uh, Azhar to Qarawiyin to Zaytuna to uh, the Jaghbub to, to many great seats of learning, was an education that actually combined two things. What was called a jama' bayna sahih al-manqul wa sarih al-maqul. Combining that which was received through trustworthy testimony meaning that which was received as, as text and teaching that orally that was transmitted. Uh, and also, صحيح الـ, uh, الـ, uh, sorry, صريح المنقول, which is, well, uh, sorry, صريح المعقول, which has to do with intellection, with cognition. In the great madrasas of the past, people did two things. They memorized the Quran and the Sunnah, but they also did a lot of معقول. They studied logic, mantiq was taught, in the East, it was basically Risala Shamsiya, and the West, it was the Sulam mainly. They did Usul al Fiqh, which is the principles of jurisprudence, and they did Balagha, which was highly cognitive. It's actually more advanced that, than even speech act theory today or, or pragmatics and, and uh, philosophy of language. They, they, they managed to combine these two things. You, you need respect for that which you receive, testimony that you receive from trustworthy sources. But you also need cognition, you need understanding. You need what is now called critical thinking. Critical thinking is now taught in arts colleges and, and uh, universities, and it's a fundamental course. It used to be taught 
in the in the in the in the madrasas as part of the the courses on logic because it really comes from Kitab al tubiqa li Aristotelis or what is called the topics in Aristotle. It taught you how wrong thinking happens, how muddled thinking happens, and how you can clean up thinking. We we've lost this tradition of teaching this to, to our kids, and in the great seats of uh, Islamic learning now in universities, someone can get a bachelor's degree in Islamic studies without ever doing logic, without ever doing critical thinking, without ever engaging in real dialogue. You know, I was just reading Kitab Sharh al Taftazani ala al Aqaid al Safiya with uh, my, my, uh, my dear friend Abdurrahman here, who's sitting in the front row. And Taftazani says in the introduction that one of the reasons Kalam, Ilm al Kalam, is called Kalam is because it cannot happen without engagement. Fain qultum qulna. Fain qultum qulna. It was dialogical, dialectical. When you lose the dialogical nature of learning, and it becomes just learning by route learning and memorizing things only without cognition, without understanding, without reflection, without engagement with other human beings who may differ with you in their views, we lose a huge, a huge deal. And, and lastly, if I may conclude with this point, another thing that happens, unfortunately, sometimes when people become too scientific, it is fundamental that education educates people to being sensible and, and sensitive to, to divine signs in the universe and in ourselves. If you just look at things as things, as facts, as, as sense data, and, and forget that these things are ayat that point to Allah Azza wa ayat that demonstrate His glory and His creativity, and that are actually in continuous process of creativity. You know, al khalq al mutajaddid as the Shaira Maturidiyya would say, and even some of the Hanabila, then we've lost a lot because if you look at the world as just things, you will abuse the world. You have to appreciate it as signs, and the most important signs are human beings who have the ultimate dignity because God gave them that dignity, and you have to respect human rights, as Dr. Karima says, and as Sheikh Hamza said earlier. You know, a few things to add. One of the most important things that has been lost, I think, in, in, in a large segment of the Muslim world is the centrality of huma the humanities. And, and traditionally, Muslims, uh, that, that was the focus. They, they were less focused on the sciences. Now, because of the, the, the colonialism and this idea of technical superiority from the Europeans, they went to the other extreme, where everything now becomes medicine and engineering. And this is still a crisis in our community. And, but, but historically, we had great poets, we had great historians, we had great social scientists. Biruni is one of the first sociologists. He went and studied. He, he sat with yogis and, and learned Sanskrit and wrote an incredible uh, book on his uh, experience in India uh, as an anthropologist. Uh, Ibn Khaldun also was a great social scientist on top of being a qadi, on top of being a master of, uh, of Maliki fiqh and other things. Um, but all of our scholars were poets, uh, the great scholars of Islam. They were actually poets of a high level. Um, they, they wrote beautiful poetry, and not this kind of doggerel that passes as poetry today. Uh, uh, people say, oh, well, the, you know, there's some of these extremists write poetry, but if you look at it, it's, it's not real poetry, it's just uh, doggerel. So, so that's one really important thing. Um, if you look at, uh, for instance, Badi' al-Zaman al-Hamadani in the Maqamat, he has a character, Abu al-Fatih al-Iskandari, who, who goes around cheating people in the name of religion. And the whole book is about this character pretending to be pious. And you know, I thought a lot about that book because it actually troubled me a lot. I mean, I loved it. I read it here in Al-Ain years ago when I was studying in the Emirates. But one of the things that really struck me is that he was really warning people about religiosity and not being, um, not succumbing to a kind of superficial religiosity that a lot of people uh, fall victim to. Uh, and, and religion is, has been used historically as, as, as a, a, a great source of, um, of uh, confidence uh, practice, con artists and things like that. Mm -hmm. and, and people can be very eloquent. And so learning about, one of the things literature does is it teaches you about characters. And, and I mean, if you look at the wonderful hadith in Nasa'i of the Prophet Sallallahu Um Zara, uh, it shows the literary nature of the Prophet's house and that Aisha was a great master of Ar Arabian literature 
uh, his wife, radiallahu anha. And that hadith, some say he narrated it, others say Aisha narrated it, but because there's different riwayah. But the point of that hadith is the incredibly elevated nature of language in the house of the Prophet. He loved poetry, he used to listen to, particularly like Ibn Abi Sult, and he would say, Ihi, let's hear some more. One of the Sahaba said, he kept saying it until I recited over a hundred verses. And people say, Ma'alamnahu sha'ru ma'in baghila. Or Sharu Wi'an Malahu Ibn Adam, a Sha'r, you know, his, the worst thing that the son of Adam could do is fill himself up with poetry. The ulama specifically said it was empty poetry, but he particularly liked wisdom poetry. So I think restoration of the humanities is, is very important, and then social sciences and studying our societies. One of the major crises we have is child rearing techniques. Uh, in the Muslim world, I, I would really like to see studies on the families of a lot of these uh, extremists and how they were raised and how their fathers treated them. And, and, and because I think what you'll find is a lot of brutality, uh, a lot of violence. I mean, we know Saddam was, was raised by his uncle, they called him Hassan al Kadab, I think, and he used to beat him with an iron pipe as a, as a young boy. And he, he learned brutality. Children. Uh, you know, uh, one of the, our poets, Yeats, uh, he's an English poet rather, but he said, I and you both know what all school children must learn. Those who, to whom evil is done do evil in return. You know, there are reasons why people go astray. The fitra is compassion. The fitra is mercy. It's not uh, cruelty. These things are learned. Mm -hmm. And I completely agree with you. Um, لا شك أن دين الإسلام هو دين الرحمة ودين العدل and I think it's يعني our duty واجب علينا أن نعلم أبنائنا هذه الخصال منذ الصغر سوف نكتفي بهذا الحد من الأسئلة أود الاعتذار لأني على يقين بأنها لا تزال لديكم أسئلة كثيرة ولكن وقتنا هنا محدود وفي الختام لا يسعنا إلا أن نشكر المتحدثين معنا جزيل الشكر على حضورهم ومشاركتهم لنا هذا الحوار المميز والشيق وأود أن أشكر الحضور على أمل أن ألقاكم في جلسات منتدى القادمة لمؤسسة سلامة بنت حمدان آل نهيان وللمزيد من المعلومات عن برامجنا أدعوكم لزيارة موقعنا www.shf.ae والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته شكراً <تصفيق>